So this morning we're going to welcome four different micro businesses, Jamie Cullen and Jeannie McLaughlin from Natural Ordinary Biz. They are teachers. They're going to be here and out, <laughs> so they need to get back to school. Um, Matt Popel from Shredigator, Kelly and Karen Neville from Special Sparkle, and Drew McInerney from Creative Souls. Um, they're going to talk about their businesses, why they got started, what the process has been like for them. Um, some of them have been doing this for a long time. Some of them are very new to it, so you get to kind of see both perspectives. Um, and then ask them to share kind of any advice that they would give people who are looking to jump into this arena. And then at the end, we're going to talk to Scott Nixon and Nicole Quenza from Life's Plan Inc., who are going to talk about ways to get micro enterprise grants to get a business started. I want to say that. Life's Plan gave us a grant when we started our customized employment initiative several years ago. Gosh, now it's like, what, five years ago almost. And it was immensely helpful to us, and we are so grateful. So they do great work, and I'm anxious for you to hear what they have to say. So we're going to start at the end and work our way through. We want to try to keep on a schedule if we can. As each presenter presents, we will try, if there's time, to let you ask questions of that presenter before we move on to the next. But if we run out of time and we're going to keep on schedule, we'll have time at the end for questions as well. Now, I know Jeannie and Jamie are leaving, so we'll try to get to their questions before they go. But we can always send them questions by email if you have them after they leave. Um, I want to say that we're not allowed to sell things here at the library. But if you want to do a deal out in the parking lot, I can't stop it. <laughs> so talk to them, get their cards. We encourage you to. To, you know, they do some cool stuff. Okay, I think we can get started. Ladies, first off, the logo, we had help from um, one of our uh, co-workers actually helped us develop the logo for this. And the name of the business, we kind of threw around different names. It was like, we started the business before we even had a name to it. Yeah. We threw uh, a bunch of names around and then we kind of came up with not your ordinary business and we're like too long, short of the biz. And then kind of play on words. We could sell other things. It wouldn't have to be necessarily nachos, but nachos is what started the whole thing. Okay. I, um, Luke and Maddie are still in school. They're seniors in high school. We started this about three years ago off an idea. I used to live in Minnesota, and a good friend of mine used to rent out party supplies. So she'd rent out a popcorn machine, a jumper, a cotton candy maker for $25 a time. So of course, every birthday party I had for my three boys, I rented from her. And I thought, well, that I was trying to think of things we could do because Jeannie and I both work for NSSEO, and one of the biggest things is trying to find something for our kids to do after they graduate. So what could we do um, after he graduates? And I met Jeannie working um, for NSSEO also, so, and our boys are the same exact age, so it's wonderful if you can find a partner. Um, and it just basically started from that idea of what could Luke do, thinking of different ideas, meeting Jeannie. And then uh, empl another employee said, oh gosh, I've always wanted a cheese machine for my, from my girlfriend for my birthday. He said I, he wanted a cheese machine. I'm like, they sell those? And... Um, that's kind of how it happened. He said, yeah, they're like $300. So I, we, my husband and I just bought Luke one and said, let's try it and see how he does. And he actually loves it and he loves the interaction and Maddie loves it. So that's kind of how it started. And my son's gluten free. And so he can actually eat the nachos, can't eat the cheese, but he can eat the nachos. So it works out. <laughs> so um, yeah, so it started at Kirk. Uh, my son actually was at minor school for 13 years. He just came to Kirk uh, with the reformatting of the schools. Um, they, the products they sell are nachos and pretzels, and it's just cash only. No checks. <laughs> so here are the bosses, Luke oh, yeah. and Maddie. Uh, Maddie's actually the one on the left, and we got Luke on the right. And they're both seniors at high school. They're together for the first time in at Kirk School. Yeah. So Luke um, operates the cheese machine, so we expect him to talk to the customers. He needs to thank them when they come through the line and push the button. And sometimes he takes, it takes a while for him to process, so it might take a little bit and the line's getting long. And, um, uh, but he does it, and every year I think the wonderful thing is that we started this early enough where now they're learning every year. They've gotten so much faster um, because the line is long now with, with the combination minor kids but uh, I just had a staff, an employee come to me and say he is doing amazing and I wanted to tell every parent in this room 
if you say, oh, there's no way my son or my daughter can do a business, I am the parent that would have told you my son or daughter cannot do this. He has been hospitalized. He used to bite. He was in the blue room every single day. So you never know the potential of your child. Now he can sit and sell nachos for 45 minutes to an hour, and he's doing tremendous. It's just constantly working with your child to do something that you hope they're going to enjoy. But Luke goes and shops for ingredients with his ABA therapist. Um, so they pick up the chips and the salsa. I know Maddie shops too. I personally, I do the ordering of the cheese because we have to get that from a, an online company for the, um, the machine that they use. But uh, they're doing great. They have to clean up and we're working on them setting it up now too because the machine is heavy. So staff do help them now set up. But All right. and you can see also on the setup, they got some salsa and some peppers here that they serve up as well. Um, there's Maddie, and he is, he's got severe apraxia. So when he um, greets customers, he is using touch chat. Um, he's very good with it. Um, he also sets up before um, they sell. And actually, um, that's, there's, he's got a task list for that. He's the money taker, and he's learned uh, at school and with ABA to use the cash box and put things in the right places and try to make change. And he also shops for ingredients with his ABA therapist as well. We're employees. <laughs> We're the two employees, and we do all the behind the scenes stuff, like create the flyers um, that are sent out uh, to both staff and to students. Um, we create posters for advertising in the schools. Um, we communicate with the school staff and uh, that work with our sons. And as Jamie said, she orders the products, like the cheese, that's to be a certain kind of cheese that's used in the machines. And she does her accounting too. And I, I think it's a positive for the kids at school too because it teaches them to hand the money over. We make the kids, when they are buying the nachos, um, I've wanted this to be a learning experience for the, not just Luke and Maddie, but for the kids too. So we have pictures out if they can't talk, they can point to what they want, if they want nachos or cheese or, so we are trying to interact and make it as positive for our customers too, so. All right, other employees are aides, teachers, and therapists from both school and home that assist with the business. I should also mention nurses. My son was diagnosed with type one diabetes a little over a year ago, so he now has a one-to-one -one nurse. And so that's who's sitting with him there at the table. And then we've got Wes is the one-to-one -one with Luke. He also does respite with Maddie as well. So they know the boys very well. And you can see the visuals there that are in front of Luke for when kids come to order what they want and uh, hand their money over. Yeah. There's their products, not the best pictures they took, but. <laughs> Uh, so that, that's like the set up like they do some chips ahead of time and then we've got Luke on the cheese machine man he, he knows how to work that thing and I'm like give your mom more than that keep pushing <laughs> <laughs> and the pretzels are come prepackaged and to warm them up they need to put them in the, the kids need to put them in the microwave for staff okay yeah so these are the hours that they're open um, we're open so Maddie works the first shift and Luke works the second shift. So we're working on different skills, like, like Luke will do the cheese machine, but now I want him to learn to start taking the money. So the nice thing is that they are still at Kirk, that they can learn these goals, we can put them in their IEPs, so that once they leave Kirk, we really have plans for them to start this as a business. We'll get to that slide, but for now, they're selling, um, they go to Minor once a week on Thursdays, and they sell to the kids and the staff there, and then they sell on Wednesdays um, at Kirk. Yeah, Maddie's got the first shift, and I think they do like a little 15, 20 minute overlap is yeah. what's happening. Mine so they work together, together the whole time. But. Yeah, so they work together a little bit, and then Luke finishes it up. All right, here's some questions that Connect the Community asked that we would answer. Um, <laughs> so you can yeah, we kind of talked about this already. Like, what, we, what prompted us to start this? It was really trying to think of something that Luke could do that he would enjoy when he gets older, something that I would enjoy, because I love eating, something I would enjoy doing with him because he will need somebody with him all the time. Um, he, you know, of course, isn't gonna be independent doing this. So I thought this sounded like a great idea. Like Jeannie said, it 
I hope it evolves into more than just a nacho business. I think it'd be great if we could rent the machine out for parties like our friend did in Minnesota. That, that's also a plan. Like, do we, you know, they can make enough money now. Can they buy a cotton candy machine next, you know, and then and then um, rent that out for birthdays. So. But, you know, as you said, it's like it was just a, a, a skill just to sit 30 to 45 minutes. Now they can, like, do up to an hour sometimes. Um, and, yeah, they're just building little by little. It's just little baby steps to get them where they're at right now. And then, as we said, they use ABA. So they're using their community skills to go shop and buy the big boxes of nachos and uh, the salsa and the peppers. All right. Process. Still evolving. Yep. <laughs> uh, as Jamie said, the original idea came from her friend that rents out the equipment. Um, our, during our first year, just buying the, the cheese machines, they're, they're expensive. They're $300 a piece. Now they're $400 because we had to get another one. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and just, you know, all the products in order to sell. And then we got the t-shirts going. And so that first year we didn't make a profit. We just yeah. pretty much broke even that year. Uh, second year. We donated the profits back. They weren't 16 yet, I don't think, so no. we, we donated their profits back to the schools. We bought um, the pool towels at Kirk, so we bought all their pool towels with the money, and we let the staff know that all the money they're making is going back to you know the school. And so one of the, I actually had asked the staff, what are some of your ideas or how you want to use the money? And that was one of the, the only idea I got, so that's what we did with the money there. And then we had an um, ice cream party at Minor with the money there too, so. And then we're trying to figure out Medicare as our next project yeah. in the process. <laughs> uh, challenges are uh, themselves. Uh, both, you know, have some health and behavioral issues. Maddie's had extreme health issues over the past few years, but I'm hoping we're getting to a level of our normal. Um, Jamie mentioned it takes them longer to do tasks due to like their processing issues. So it's like we need patience from people, you know, that. It might take them a little bit of time to give them your change back or something like that. Both need consistent one-to-one -one help. Yep. Um, we had the broken cheese machine. That's why we had yeah. to buy the $400 one. But we got that one fixed because I have a handy dad. <laughs> so Maddie's grandfather, yeah. And he figured out to fix it with an $80 part. So we have a backup machine, yep. which is great. Which is nice. Um, and then, as we said, our, our biggest next challenge is that both, both our boys turn 18 next year. Uh, Maddie in January and Luke in April. So uh, figuring out Medicare is our next challenge. So successes. Yeah, we um, both have IEP goals for our boys for the business relating to that because that's, num I mean, first the number one was for me was to get Luke to sit still for that long, which he has achieved. Um, so we have other goals now for him to actually be able to set up. He's a big boy, so he can lift and do things. So he's doing really well um, with that. And we'll continue, like, once he can set up, what can he do next? Um, and this year, we're hoping to actually make a profit because of Medicare. We, we do want the boys to be able to qualify for Medicare, so. And that's a bunch of dollar bills because they're paid in dollar bills mostly. <laughs> <laughs> so that's their pile of money. <laughs> And then what advice we have is just find something that interests your child um, and don't feel like they have to know everything at once. It's a learning process. We've been doing this for three years and they have another, both have three more years at Kirk. So we're hoping by the time they're done that we would love to buy a food truck. That is our goal to find businesses that mm -hmm. would let the boys sell or schools. We're from Lincolnshire. So I will be on top of Stevenson to let the, try to get the boys um, to sell there um, one day a week. And we also thought about um, Buffalo Grove High School. So we're talking and trying to figure out ways that once they do graduate, how can we branch out their business and help them? So we're still learning too. So the best way would be to come to the people <laughs> in their food truck and we should put all our little pictures in there. <laughs> So that's our goal. So we have for a couple of questions for them before they have to leave. Does anybody have questions? Hi. <laughs> um, what kind of business did you set up? Is it a nonprofit or did you set it up as a We did not set it up as a nonprofit, no. No, so we donated the money back at first too, but 
Um, I didn't even realize the connection to Medicare. A mom came up to me and said, are you doing this so that you can get Medicare? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And so now I'm really interested in doing that to get Medicare because I didn't even, like I'm learning too, I didn't even realize that was not something we could do. Yeah, yeah, we haven't set it up yet because they um, like that because we were just donating it back. But my husband's an accountant, so we are going to be setting it up. But he goes, the minute you do that, you have all the taxes and all that. But I'm assuming for Medicare we need to do that, which is why I wish I could stay, but I have to get back. <laughs> <laughs> this Medicare connection, I know you probably can't explain it, but I hadn't heard that before. Yeah, I, I had to either. Learned about we it. just learned yeah. about it, too. Okay. I'll Okay. <laughs> we'll watch this later and yeah, <laughs> hear what he has to say. Um, it's called quarters of coverage. So if you earn a certain amount of money of quarters per year, I believe it's right now 1220 per year. So let's say these young men turn 18 and they each earn $1,220 next year. It could be across the whole year they get one quarter of coverage. I think it's by the time they reach 26, they get six. 24. 24. 24. Thank you. Um, they now could be eligible on their own work record for SSC, which would be a very tiny little check, likely if they're going to make 12 million, but they would be eligible for Medicare. So my name is Matt. Um, my son Luke has a shredding business. I'm going to introduce Luke to you here. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about this Medicare credit thing, too, because we went through all that. I've actually got Luke's tax returns up here, which you're more than welcome to look at to show you technically how that works. But you need to know Luke. And it, and it speaks to their point of, you know, you think you got a kid that can't do a darn thing, okay? Luke was one of those kids too, so here you go. Uh, the doctors, 
Uh, actually, his pediatrician was the very last one to admit that despite the fact that he had had a lot of rigorous uh, medical testing on his optic nerve and it was determined that he would never be able to see, that in fact he could see. Is that what you want to get? Uh, do, you have, do, you get do you have a gift card or do you have cash? He has cash. Cash, okay. He has earned this money. Wow. And how did you do that? He shreds. He does confidential doctor to start. Oh, that's great. What's going to happen when we're gone? That's always, that is the number one concern of a, of a person that, that has a special needs kid. <laughs> so what Shredigator provides for him is a, is a real income source uh, for him. It provides him the ability to file a legitimate tax return and get social security credits so that he can qualify for Medicare on his own. So if something were to happen to me and I were to lose insurance coverage, he would have that as a backup. He enjoys uh, uh, feeding the documents. Of course, he likes the big paper. Uh, he loves tractor feed documents that he can just feed through there and he, and he fills the bags quickly that way. And of course he enjoys getting paid, going to the store, buying his movies or whatever it is. That's a real sense of pride for him. And it's something that really carries through in other parts of his life and gives him confidence so that he knows he can do something. He doesn't have to be a This time you're a no. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the boy. He's 26 now. Um, and uh, I guess what I would tell you is you just, you just don't know what your kid's capable of early on in the game. And he was about, I don't know, maybe 20, 19, 20, and there he's 26 now, almost 27. So we've been doing this business for a little while. And um, Schrodinger is just part of who he is. So it's a scary place the future is, right? Anybody not agree with that? Scary, it's really scary. Because what, what's gonna happen to your kids? But you never give up on them. Just like Jamie and Jean were talking about, they didn't give up on their kids. I mean. They, her son's a biter and in the blue room, and oh my gosh, what are we going to do with him? Well, now they're selling nachos, you know? And that's, you just, you just can't give up. And you got to kind of have a vision for where you're going with your kid. And I know you're exhausted. And if you tell me you're not exhausted, you're lying to me. Because for most of us in this world, just getting through the day without a major meltdown and maybe you get 30 minutes to read a book before you go to bed, that's a good day, right? But you got to invest in the future of your of your son or daughter. If there's any professional staff, push the kids. And if you're going to IEP, still bring food. This is just little bits of wisdom I had to throw in. Because you want to be that parent that everybody likes to see at the school. You really do. Because they'll help you more. All right. So why start a micro business? Well, the first thing is we believe every everybody's made to work. You know, and don't let government benefits like steal away the opportunity for your son or daughter to, to do something on their own. Um, they talked a little bit about Medicare and SSDI. If you don't know what that is, go to a Sherry Schneider a Family Benefit Solutions Seminar uh, or come to the transition. This is something you need to know about. There's SSI, which you get because you're poor and disabled and whatever, and then there's SSDI, like us working people, we earn credits, and then when you get to be old like me, you can retire and they give you Social Security and like that kind of thing. Your son or daughter can qualify by earning six, Scott calls them quarters or credits. And that's a grand total of about six or eight grand worth of income before they're 24. You have to do it within a three year period, I think. I've kind of lost track of it, but that's really important because that qualifies them for all kinds of benefits that they're not currently available to them. The other thing is people in the community want to help you. Your question about does the school, how are they about supporting the nacho guys? They loved it. People love this. They want to help you. But not necessarily charitable all the time. You know what I mean? So you got to create like a real life business. 
so my kid can't really do anything. And that's, that's where we were all the way up. And you know, you think of a special needs guy and what do they do? They bag it in jewel. Well, that's not Luke's deal. I'll guarantee you. The smells, the whatever, <laughs> Karen knows that is not Luke's deal. He's not working in a kitchen. <laughs> He's not doing anything like that. But Amy, our older daughter, said, no, Luke deserves to do something he wants to do. This is our 12-year-old daughter standing up, you know. And that really challenged us to think about what he could do. There's a guy that talked about employment for a kid whose favorite thing to do was to throw hammers. That's what this kid loved to do, take a hammer and pitch it across the room. Now, is that an employable kid? Yes, if you take him to a rock quarry, and what they have to do is sort rocks out. Big rocks over here, small rocks over there, and that's what the kid does. Does that give you an idea? Okay, some nuts and bolts. You talked about an LLC. Maybe a business is big enough for, to do something like that, but Luke is not that. We, it's a sole proprietorship. We created a separate checking account just in his personal name on his social security number. Because again, you have to report income to get social security credits, right? If you're not reporting income, you're not getting credits and you're not getting progress towards Medicare. Does that make sense? So you're gonna have to pay tax. We started Shredigator a little bit as, we had little boxes about the size of that, like a file box. And you know, giving them to grandma and the neighbors and whatever, because everybody's got their junk mail and they wanna get it shredded that. That's not terribly sustainable, working with individuals. Because again, that's sort of more charitable, if you will. And people lost the boxes, and then they, you know what I mean? It's, you pick them up, you charge 10 bucks, cost you more in gas, it will pick them up. And, you know, so we really focused on businesses. And it's a for-profit business. And we're focused on service excellence. We're not a charity. I think that's a key thing for sustainability. Somebody will give you some help and some money and whatever, but the well's gonna run dry on that at a point. Um, so Luke goes on all the sales calls, most of the pickups. Uh, we give invoices. There's examples in this, this book up here if you want to take a look at it. I mean, it's a real business, you know. He's got a, an invoice. Um, we do certificates of destruction when it's done because we're going to places that have sensitive documents. We're going to medical providers, we're going to lawyers, we're going to financial places, not banks, but you know, smaller investment kind of places and whatever. Uh, insurance agents, that kind of thing. So they want to know that their stuff is being taken care of. And heaven forbid that information ever got out. We'd be in deep soup. So we keep careful control on all that, all the documents. Okay. That's a real quick <coughs> overview. What questions do you have about Luke's shredding business? Yes? Did you have to be certified at all for the document destruction and being able to give certificates and stuff? Uh, yeah. question is, do you need to be certified for that? There is a shredding organization that you could become certified with. It costs thousands of dollars. No, I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I go out, and part of the reason I got a Shredigator embroidered shirt, I just got this at Embroid Me, you know what I mean? And we have client service agreements, and we have a, a thing, and Luke goes in and tells his joke. You know, that's his, every salesman's got a joke. Why does a skeleton go to the library? Why? To bone up on a few things. <laughs> and the customers laugh right away. And then, you know, I would go into, hey, this is a serious deal. You know, we're going to take care of your doctor. And, they, and again, it's a service they already have. And we charge the same thing, actually a little bit less, really, when it comes down to it. So it's a sustainable deal. But there's a trust factor that you gotta get through in order to do that. Yes, uh, you talked a little bit about how you've got clients, but can you give a little more detail? Like how, how do you get clients? Yeah. yeah. Well, you gotta be bold. You gotta start talking to all your friends and relatives, in our case, like I went to our state farm agent. I'm like, hey Bill, what do you think? Well, so he's kind of a good sell. And then on the website, <clears throat> you will see I use them 
as kind of an example how it works. So there's Judy right here from the State Farm Agent. So it, so it starts building. And then he knows other State Farm Agents. And like some of them are in and some of them are not. And we have people go, well, do you think you could, you know, do it cheaper? And I'm like, no. You know, Luke handles every piece of paper individually. We're going to charge a fair rate. I'm not, you know, so some are in and some are not. And then, oh, and Bill knows, uh, I, got, I went to his dentist. We pay tons of money to this dentist. You <laughs> darn well how to be a You know, and then he knows another dentist. And you see how you kind of do that. You got to follow up. And you got to go, hi. My name's Matt. Uh, this is Luke, and you know what I mean. It's that is the key hardest thing is getting customers. You got to invest a lot of energy. You got to put your big boy pants on and just go out and sell it and advocate for your son. Now Luke is very engaging. He's funny. He'd be a real pain in the rear end. But you get him to tell his skeleton joke, you know, and then he's engaged. And then the, once the customers hear the skeleton joke and they see like, oh, this looks like a real deal, then they're sold. I never had somebody go, oh, no, no, thanks, once they met Luke. That was the trick, was bringing him. Somebody would be like, oh, send me a flyer. Well, hey, if you have 15 minutes, you should just meet Luke, you know, because that's the hook. Yeah? How many hours a week can Luke work? I mean, the work? Just a couple. Just a couple. Just a couple. That's about it. Uh, this is Halloween season because the new clothes. No, <laughs> Luke loves Halloween. He loves the scary stuff, so he wants to buy Halloween stuff. So he's very motivated right now. So yeah, a few hours a week. Does your customer demand exceed that, and therefore you have to employ someone else? We do. Uh, Joanne and I help out. Mm -hmm. We do. No, we don't employ anybody else. And, and uh, we thought about making this like. A, a real growing enterprise, and you know what? I'm 63, and I'm not interested in picking up shredding boxes the rest of my life, <laughs> yeah. and driving a truck with the shredding thing on the back, and uh, employees and all that. No, I, we just want to keep it kind of small. So he earns a few thousand dollars a year, which is enough to earn his credits. It's enough to buy his Halloween junk, <laughs> movies. Yeah. And then 10 years, do you have idea, someone in mind to help manage operations? Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, so Joanne and I live, Luke lives in a group home, we're in an in a addition on the back of the house, which is a whole separate story, so we're going to be there for the next 10 years. It gets sketchy down the road, because these documents are confidential, and I, you know, none of his roommates, none of the staff, you know, can see, touch, or any of this, so it might fold after we're gone. I don't know. Maybe one of our daughters or our granddaughter, our 12-year-old granddaughter that, that helps shred, sometimes she might do that. I don't know. But, yeah, gotcha. Yeah. I mean, shredding is, everything's more and more digital all the time. There's less and less paper all the time. So it's maybe not a super sustainable thing, but it's accomplished a thing for a time at least. Yes. Anything else for Matt? So he's the only paid employee yeah, all the income goes to him. You uh, facilitate, but that's, you don't keep track of your hours or other expenses or that kind of thing. It's, no. Yeah. Not really. Now that he's got his credits, you know, we'll we'll deduct from his income like mileage and mileage. the cost of, you know, to give you an idea, the shredder that he uses is about eleven hundred dollars shredder. I mean, it's a it's a real deal, and it's a fellow shredder. Just it's a funny story. Uh, there is in Wheaton, there's a guy named Jamie Fellows that owns Fellows Incorporated. You know the shredding company? Well, he saw this video and he pulled his tech people and he goes, Why does my shredder smell like a skunk? <laughs> <laughs> very, very funny. Yeah. And they did support us. They've, they've, they've given us some, some stuff over time. So people want to reach out to you, but you know, it's not like they're giving us shredders for life. But those boxes that we use, they're about you know, this big and they hold. Um, I don't know how many pounds, probably 60 pounds worth of paper. And those are about $100 a piece. You know, I probably got 30 or 40 of them out there in different places. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's a financial investment which we built up to over a period of time, you know, but it's definitely worth it because Luke qualified for Medicare on his own record. Mm -hmm. So, I do want to tell you this is a whole other category, but I'll just say there are ways to 
rite of pass plan that will allow you to buy equipment for a business and then it gets deducted off of what's sort of taken out of your social security. Mm -hmm. It's um, a little bit of a complicated process, but if you want to email us at you know, CTC, I'll be happy to give you the link for information about it. But So there is a way to invest in your business and, and sort of not get, not get charged as much of, in terms of taking away from your benefits. Oh, and Linda, yeah. that's allowed to be over $2,000 then, right? Yeah. You can go over that. Right. Man, yeah, you can't have assets of over $2,000. You can earn a lot of money. It's like $1,200 a month or something and not mess up the benefits. And if your son or daughter can earn $1,200 a month, God bless you, just be happy. <laughs> you know what I mean? It'll start to chip away to their benefits, but that's not like a big deal. You know, you're really just trying to give them a, 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 a purpose in life and, uh, you know, something to do and they earn a little bit of income. So, and there is a micro enterprise grant that might help you if you apply. And We're gonna get to show you that. First of all, let's describe our business. Our business is called Special Sparkle. Kelly likes to say that I'm special and she's sparkle, but really the whole thing is right here. And um, so Kelly makes all the jewelry. Everything that is made here, we brought a sampling of, of some things to show you the um, different lengths and different things that she is capable of doing. Um, but it's really more than that. Kelly also helps me shop for beads. We go to the gem show, and as long as I keep her away from the purple constant, I didn't even bring any, I didn't even bring anything purple. But I mean, we have to like think of all kinds of things. But she's learned a ton over the years, and so she helps me shop for beads. She helped me design. It's amazing how much she's learned about design in the last eight years. We are in our finishing up our eighth year of business. Um, she also helps unload everything, keep track of everything. Um, as long as she doesn't clean up too much, sometimes she likes to surprise me and I'm like, well, where is everything? Now we have labels and I have those little cubbies like from Ikea and everything's labeled because um, it's no fun looking for that little box of beads because we need more of this, you know. So we pretty organized now, Kelly helps with all of that. Um, she designs some of the things on her own. Uh, she's gotten really good at measuring and things like that. Um, we also do necklaces. We mostly do bracelets. We would do, in the beginning, we did a lot of necklaces too, but we would sell 100 bracelets before anybody would even look at a necklace, which I thought was really weird, but we just learn things as you go. Um, we're a mother-daughter team, so we go to craft fairs. Certainly this isn't sustainable without me, um, but she does make everything and it's authentic that way. Um, we do sell to a couple of stores now, and um, our business has continues to grow. We have over 8,000 followers now on Facebook, thanks to somebody named Chris Ulmer, from Special Books by Special Kids. Um, so what prompted us to start this business? Well, when Kelly was younger, and I was working twofold on Thank speech, you. reading, and everything, and just that I thought, because I was working in a school, that I would go to work, and she would go to work. Maybe it would be 20 hours a week or something like that, but we would have, we would be doing this. Well, when she was in high school, and I was trying to figure out the whole SSI thing, so when they talk about Medicare, they're really putting the horse before the cart. It's, it starts with SSI. I was trying to figure that out. I was going to these seminars, and it's confusing. So I wouldn't just go to one seminar, then I would sign up for this one, then I would sign up for this one, until I came away one day thinking, I don't think I learned anything new. I think I'm starting to understand it. But they kept talking about these work credit things. And Kelly did get a job at Small Smiles, which is a pediatric dentist. She works four hours a week. So at the time, it was a different amount of money, but I was looking at the quarters, and I'm sitting there, my little thing, doing the math, I'm thinking, she's not gonna earn one quarter, because it starts January 1st, and you got to earn that quarter in the calendar year. So if you're $20 short, and it clicks over to January 1st, you know, back to square one. So I'm like, she's never going to earn one, one credit. How are we going to do this? And you talk about that. Everybody would say, have you tried the jewel? Have you tried the Dominic's? And I'm like, first of all, the reason this works for us is she can do it at her pace with what she wants to do. She would comment on every single thing she put in your bag. Oh, I really like this pie. I had this pie. In fact, last year I had this pie. I mean, it would never work standing on her feet that long, bending over like that. She doesn't, she doesn't like that. And so I was like, how are we going to be able to earn the money? But also, when the, when the handwriting was on the wall that 
we, she was going to not have this full life. In school, everything's planned for you. You're going shopping, you're going here, you're doing this, you're going to the library, you're coming home, you're doing, all of a sudden that's gonna end. How, how sad is that I wasn't gonna go to work every day while she's at home waiting for her life to start because she needs somebody to help her do things. So it was kind of like, I'm gonna have to leave my job, which I loved, and um, what are we gonna do because we're not watching the Disney Channel all day long? What are we going to do? Simple. At the same time this was all going on, we signed up to be public speakers for the National Association for Down Syndrome. So when we would go out and go to hospitals and schools and fire stations and police stations and stuff like that, talking about individuals with disabilities, um, different type of discussion, depending upon if we're talking to labor and delivery nurses versus a school with children versus a police station, but we have developed all these PowerPoints. I saw what that did for her. We would prepare, we would go out, they would see and meet her, and on the way home, her confidence was just so much better. I mean, she just felt so, like they would elect her and stuff. So we just, we decided that we were going to start something that she liked to give her purpose to wake up in the morning. Who would want to wake up every day and go, I have nothing to do today, what am I gonna do now? I, you know. So it was kind of all these things coming together. She, um, you know, still works at Small Smiles, still four hours a week. She loves it there, they're good to her, but we build around this. So we do go out, on Monday we're going to the genetic counselors at Northwestern University to talk about Down syndrome and genetic conditions and how to, how to approach and talk to parents. Um, so we do still that. So we kind of build, we have a very busy week actually. And we do this. Now most of the things that we do, we go to craft fairs. Now the first time we went out, I couldn't believe it, but they didn't believe that she did this. So what do we have to do, Cal? When we go out now, what do we have to do? Sell, sell, sell. Well, <laughs> you're, not, you're not even listening. Why? What do you do because people didn't believe that you made the jewelry? Well, they just stare at me. They stared at you, so now we demonstrate. Now she goes and she, she has to, sit there and, and, and make so that people see that she does it. And it's really kind of sad. I mean, you don't walk up to the uh, you know, other people and be like, do you really sell this? Do you have a sewing machine? I want to check that out, make sure you really did this. But for some reason, they do that with her. So we do all of that. Now, everything kind of took a turn for the better for us when a man named Chris Elmer gave me a call and said, hey, do you mind if I come awesome. over and can I, can I interview Kelly? I'm like, sure, come on over. I had no clue how popular he was. And from that, we went from, you know, I don't know, we had like 700 likes on our Facebook page, and we have like 8,300 now. So it, it really helped promote and people were able to see her. But it's about awareness too. Half the reason we go out and speak, it's about everybody that we meet and we tell her story and they meet her, maybe they go out and their expectations rise just a little bit, you know? It's gonna take a lifetime. It's, she's 28, we've been doing this for eight years. It's going to take a long, long time. We feel like every time we leave, we feel good. Those kids just learned something today and, and they met somebody else that maybe the next time they're sitting in a class and a new kid comes to class and that person has to be a little different, they're not so taken aback by it. It's just like, oh, hi, you know? I mean, that's what our goal is. So that's how we got started. It was, to, and she loves fashion. She loves style and bling and anything purple and sparkly. So that's what we went with. I really didn't give it a whole lot of thought, didn't realize until other people tried to do what she was doing um, that she really has good fine motor. She couldn't stand and couldn't bag groceries, but man, she can sit there and the smallest bead that we do is a, is a two millimeter bead that she can handle. So that um, was just lucky that our first shot at what maybe we should do is, is the thing that, that worked for her. Um, so what was the process like? Well, it wasn't too bad in the beginning. There's a place called SCORE. SCORE is a, a non, it, it doesn't cost you anything. Yeah. SCORE Fox Valley is up by us. It's retired business people who um, will sit with you. you. You go online, you can sign up. They'll find somebody that kind of meet, meets the same thing. You know, we wanted to do craft fairs in the beginning. We got, a, you know, and we're selling online and stuff like that. But in the beginning, we got some people who did that on the side to kind of say, and they gave us, okay, here's what you do to start your business. It was literally step by step by step. Now, the first thing they said, one of the first questions they said, well, how much money do you want to earn? 
And just like you, you're like, well, you see, you're they're not looking at this. They're not looking at this the right way. I really don't care. I mean, I do care. I don't want to lose money, obviously, but they just did not really know how to handle that. I said that's secondary to all the other things that we all take so much for granted. To have purpose, to have you know stuff like that. So SCORE helped us initially with, with figuring out how to not. Now I am a sole proprietor too, and that's because. When you get into corporations, I, I mean, I don't really know all that much, but you have to file all these other things. But the thing about it is, just like when they, they, they pay cash, just like you were saying, this is a real company. I pay quarterly taxes. I'm probably the only crafter that comes home and goes, okay, I gotta back out those taxes and put it in. I have spread, you have to be very organized. But I bet I pay taxes. She gets a salary because SSI cannot figure out that we have like cyclical things. Oh my gosh, you know what? They were, we were getting called in all the time. All her work thing changed. So you know what? She gets a salary. And it's the same every single month. And here's how this business works. I don't make any money from this business. Now Special Sparkle, I have a, a doing business as bank account. And that has that money has grown in there. Now that money's away from her, maybe, <coughs> Special Sparkle. But that money is someday when we're done with this, is going to be used for whatever I may see that she needs at that time. So while she makes a salary, and I was able to control that so that she doesn't make too much and she doesn't make too little, and she can um, and earn, uh, she gets a W-2. I've got, I had to figure that out. I have an e-smart paycheck. You go in, I put in the hours, and it puts me out all this stuff. I mean, I had to figure out all that stuff a little at a time. So it was daunting to sit there and go, how am I going to do here? You just need to take that next step. And the SCORE people were wonderful. I've met with them a couple times. Um, some things were helpful, some things I had to figure out on my own. Um, I had to figure out how to use my really nice camera, which now is set that no one can touch it. I don't care if the most wonderful thing happened, don't touch that camera. It is set to take really close up pictures and I don't know how to reset it. <laughs> so I have a $1,500 camera that no one can touch. And I figured out how to do it. I, I this summer, we designed a new website, Kelly and I. We, we figured it out because they changed their platform, whatever that means, and so I had to take what I had. I figured out my camera. I figured out how to do the website. You have to be able to pick up the phone and ask a question. I don't know how to do that. You want to do something on your phone? Just ask a kid. Honest to goodness, they just know how to do it. My daughter Lexi, who is her younger sister, she's 28, she's 25, Lexi, who just became a speech pathologist, and so now she's helping kids all over Indiana, unfortunately. But she helps us with our social media. I was afraid to touch a button, you know, I might do something wrong. So, so part of it was easy, part of it was like I took it a little bit a step at a time. Um, what are big challenges? Taxes. I made a mistake the first year and I got a $200 fine. And I called the IRS and you know what, they were very, very nice. I made another mistake another year when I didn't read something that the tax, so believe it or not, the taxes went up 7.75, then they went down to 7.5, and you have to go on the like, Illinois Gov something. I didn't read something there, so guess what? I charged 7.75 when it went back down to 7.5. I called the IRS again and said, oh my gosh, I made a mistake. Not a problem, this is what you're gonna do. And they were very, very helpful. So you know what? I was very nervous about that. I have it all written down now. I have a file that's quarterly taxes. Every single step of the thing is I've written down for mine. For my, you know, benefit, I'm not an accountant. Listen, I have, I have a real business. I have a website that costs your shopping cart costs. I have a credit card reader that costs. They take a percentage of that. I have insurance because there's crazy people out there in the world. I have a $500 a year I pay in insurance in case somebody comes home and says, "Oh, my dog swallowed a bee," you know, and we're going to sue you when you're a sole proprietor. I'm scared about that. So I have a two million dollar insurance policy, making sure that nobody. I mean, the last thing you want to do when you do anything, you're doing this for your child, you don't want to put your family in jeopardy of something else bad happening. So we've had to pay into that. She makes that, I don't make anything, but the reward that I get, her confidence and everything has gone. Um, we've made a, a few, you know, things that I've sold over the years, and like those magnet beads, and now I think, oh my, I'm glad those were a long time ago, because I don't want anybody to get hurt. Our successes have been great. Her confidence, how, what she can make, the fact that she, she come, I'll come down to her, she's like, I designed something. And sometimes I'm like, eh, you know, I don't know if that'll really sell. Does anybody wear, you know, put all that together? But most of the time now, I'm like, okay, that works. We can work with this. This is what we can do. How about we do this? And so she has her favorites. 
and stuff like that. That Chris Elmer video was amazing for us because it really, we sold to every single state in the United States. And one of the problems was I didn't know, because you have to turn it off to take international orders. So when Chris Elmer video hit, in the middle of the night, I had to wake my husband and say, turn this down, I'm getting orders from Belgium and Australia and Germany. What, what do you mean this is open to the, you know, I didn't even know how that worked. So that has been really good for us. We've sold actually internationally now. We can say we sold internationally, although we closed it, because I certainly do not know how to sell and all the government regulations around the world. But you never know, maybe in the future we do something like that. Um, what advice do we have for who's thinking about starting a business? Okay, so I would use SCORE. I would recommend them any day of the week. They're very, very helpful. Um, I would only go into business with somebody if you put every single thing in writing. You've got to be equal partners if you do that. These two ladies that are here, that's great. They seem like they get along. But it needs to be two equal partners. It's, it's, it's kind of scary if you don't do something like that from the get-go. Organization is key. Being organized, knowing how much. I have a folder so I figure out all the cost of all the bracelets so I know how much to charge. And I charge a little more online because, let's face it, it's very expensive. you got to pay for that your, your um, URL name, I mean, you have to pay for that website. Um, it must be something that you both love. It really is. I know your son has always loved shredding. And I know he loves, I know he loves Looney Tunes, I know he loves Halloween, and he really likes shoes. He's a yes. shoe guy. So I mean, you know, he does something he really loves, and he's able to, you know, be motivated by that. If you don't do, she loves all this, if she didn't, it would be hard for both of us. It has to be something that they can kind of do on their own, too. If you have to stand hand over hand, you're both going to get burned out. Um, asking your child what they like is sometimes hard. Go ahead and ask them what they don't like. They have a list, let me tell you. And it grows. And then, you know, that helps, though. It helps to go. She doesn't like to do outdoor stuff. Heaven forbid a fly should touch this hair. I mean, she, <laughs> she just... Years and Here's a mosquito bite. Or mosquito bite. Oh my gosh. So we don't do, you know what, we don't do it. People always say, oh, you should do the fairs in the summer. They're, you know what, she doesn't, it's not. So we're, you got to kind of go with what you have, what, what you know, and what's right for you. And um, so it's all about what you want to do. And, um, you know, our model works for us. And actually, we've tried to hire a couple of times. And it hasn't really worked out only because you know, one time a young lady came and she just didn't want to do it. I don't think it was her thing. I think she liked it a few times and then she's like, nah. Uh, another friend, she really did well. It was after Chris Elmer's video hit. We could use some help. And then, but she lives kind of far away. So, you know, we're kind of right there. If things <coughs> took up a little more, maybe we could hire somebody else. But that's about where we're at. And that's our model. So. Hello everyone, so my name is Drew McNamara and I am the founder of Creative Souls. So this is just a little table of contents just about what I'm going to be talking about. And this typically is a 30 to an hour presentation, <laughs> so I'm going to try and uh, make that much quicker and kind of glance through everything. Um, okay, so a little bit about me. Again, my name is Drew. I received my master's in social work from the University of Illinois in Champaign uh, in 2018, and I currently work full-time as a case management supervisor at Little City uh, with the children's program, so I'm working with children with disabilities. Uh, I love Chipotle, it's just a fun <laughs> fact about me, um, and I think what got me to this point where I'm at in my life is that in the fourth grade I met an individual. Um, one of my friends on my baseball team, his brother had Down syndrome. And this was in the fourth grade. A lot of the kids on the team weren't, my parents would always say that they weren't as friendly as I was to him. And I always wanted to be around him when he was at the games. And so I started joining uh, Buddy Baseball, Best Buddies, um, and working in the summer as a counselor with kids with disabilities. And so that has brought me to studying social work and ultimately what I'm doing now at Little City. Uh, and Creative Soul is just a, a huge part of my life, which I'm, I'm excited to talk to you guys about. So this is a quick little video of where I was at about a year and a half ago. And this will give you a, a clear picture of what it was, and then I'll discuss what we are now. Um, if it'll let me play. 
Right now, there are 57 million people with disabilities in the US. Of that number, only 17% are unemployed, meaning more than 45 million individuals with disabilities don't have a job in the US. Hi, my name is Drew McNamara. For as long as I can remember, I've had a passion for helping people with disabilities. I'm the founder of Creative Souls. The mission of Creative Souls is to empower people with disabilities to make an income while gaining an amazing learning experience where they can feel included and show their unique personalities through the artwork they have created. For over a year, I've been working with artists who have disabilities. We started out with hand painting shoes. I've been able to help about seven artists right now with disabilities. However, I see a bigger picture, one where we can reach thousands of people with disabilities across the US. This is where you come into play, Kickstarter. My goal is to raise $50,000. With the money raised, I will be able to make Creative Souls go from hand-painted shoes to printed shoes just like these. There's a printer that I would like to purchase that costs $20,000. With the printer, I can have people with disabilities send me sketches on a white sheet of paper. Once someone sends me a sketch, I can scan it and have the printer directly print the sketch on the sheet. Besides a sketch, I can have people send me in a photo and a graphic design. If the project's funded, Creative Souls will be able to not only buy the printer, but have an inventory of shoes and be able to reach thousands of people with disabilities all across the US. With that said, let's help raise an employment rate for people with disabilities, one Creative Soul at a time. So that was my video for a Kickstarter campaign that I was attempting to do about a year and a half ago, right around when I uh, launched this. So, to the next slide. So, the facts. 17% of all people with disabilities are employed, so that's over 83% who are not. Uh, and that means there's about 47 million who are not working right now. And some won't be able to, and there are a lot of people, though, that are looking for jobs and opportunities. And that's what I'm trying to provide. So a timeline is, in 2015, I was sitting in a social entrepreneurship class at the University of Illinois, and I had to come up with an idea that could change society in some way. And I always knew that I, I wanted to focus on disabilities, and so I was thinking, what can I do that is different from what other people are doing and bring you know, this population into, into a business in a way? So this is where Creative Souls started. Um, then in 2016, hand painting shoes actually started uh, in an internship that I was in, and from there, Kickstarter campaign, and then to where we're at today, and I'll talk more about it uh, coming up. So again, I was in a class, and I had to come up with an idea. And so in that class, I got the basic idea down, just of I wanted to provide an opportunity for people to disclose to hand paint on shoes and earn money while doing it. Back then it was called Creative Souls, still the same name, but different spelling. It was focused on s shoes, so it was S-O-L-E-S, -E but now I've opened it up to Souls to you know, be around people, but also open up to more products than just shoes. So a year went by, I wasn't really doing much with Creative Souls. I went abroad and then came back, and in my last semester as a senior, I was in an internship where my supervisor asked me, what do I, what do I want to do this semester? So I said, I have an idea that I worked on last year, but it hasn't gone anywhere. So he said, let's, let's do that this whole semester. Let's work on it. So from there, I created my first website using Squarespace. Um, I started going to art festivals. I teamed up with a local agency in Champaign. And I had seven artists hand painting shoes. Uh, but pretty quickly, I realized there were some setbacks. Um, I realized that people wanted one design in a size seven, but the artist made it in a size six. So I was stuck, I'm like, well, I can have the artist try and recreate similar, but the shoes are pretty much unique to itself. So I was sitting on one of the last few days of the internship with my supervisor, I'm like, what if there's a printer out there that I could take a design and just print it right onto shoes and shirts and other things like that? He's, and he says to me, uh, that seems like a, a pretty crazy idea, but I, let's look it up. So we looked it up, and I found this printer. And uh, the bad news was that it was over $25,000. So 
that was the end of the internship. Again, time went by. Then I was back at U of I for my master's. And I was like, a few months went by into school and I was sitting there, I'm like, I really want to do Creative Souls. I don't want to let it be. I, I think I'm onto something. I don't know what, but uh, so I started planning what I can do. So I realized I had to raise money and over $25,000 was just the beginning. I had to raise more than that. Um, but the printer, the idea was that I could take designs from a, a sheet of paper and just print it right onto shoes in a matter of minutes. And it allows me to reach, like I said in the video, thousands of people with disabilities all across the world, rather than just seven local artists hand painting shoes. And it also, it doesn't have to be at a certain place. They could do it in their homes, at agencies, at school, they can create art just on a regular sheet of paper. And then just scan it and send it to me, and then I do the rest. So I really thought, like, th this is the way I'm going to scale this business. So I started thinking of what can I do? So I made a Kickstarter campaign. The goal was $50,000. I raised over $15,000 in 30 days. But unfortunately on Kickstarter, you don't get to keep any money when you don't reach your goal. So while it was amazing that I raised that much money and had, I think about 300 people who backed my campaign, I didn't keep a dime from it. The money went right back to the backers. So. Shortly after that, a week later, I was like, okay, let, let me look into a different website that I could raise money. So I found a, a platform called You Caring Campaign. Um, they got bought out by GoFundMe about a month after I launched mine, so I'm <laughs> happy about that. I, I did it right in time. But I was able to raise $10,000 from it, which was amazing because on Kickstarter, people are backing your, your campaign for a product. Um, but on you caring, it's just they're donating the money to you. So I, I wouldn't have to, you know, I wouldn't have to make shoes for them. I'm just receiving money so that I could put it towards the, the printer. Um, about midway through the Kickstarter campaign, I got a call. And this person from Chicago has a brother who has a disability at an agency called Camp Hill Sultane. And that's located in Pennsylvania. Uh, he reached out to me saying he'd like to hear more about Crave Soul, so I started talking to him about it, and he said that there was a fund that Camp Hill Sultan was trying to start to fund companies uh, that were helping people with disabilities, or at least ran by someone with a disability. And he wanted Creative Souls to be the first uh, company that they would fund. So I was very fortunate that I, he saw my Kickstarter campaign, because about uh, a year later, he ended up, Camp Hill Sultane ended up giving the, the funds to purchase the printer. And it was a little over $25,000 to purchase the printer. So this past November, I received the printer, and I actually have it. So things changed from there on. I realized I, I had to really focus on creating better um, content on social media. I had to work on my website. And my website on Squarespace was great, I thought, at first. But then I, about five months ago, started to build a new one on a platform called Shopify, which if you're thinking about doing a business and it's an e-commerce business, look into Shopify. It's a great platform. If you're thinking about blogs or trying to tell a story uh, or, or showing art without selling, I would suggest Squarespace. Um, so this is what the printer looks like. Sorry about the mess in the picture. It's always messy because I'm always working. Um, it's giant. It is about 260 pounds, and we had to get it into my basement, which was a big struggle. But we did it. Um, here's a quick little video. I'll probably skip to the end. But this is what it looks like actually running. Um, so the shoes are on a thing called a platen. And once I hit a gr giant green button, it starts printing like that. So I set up the design on a, basically an application on my computer. And with the shoes, I take a picture of the shoes blank. And then I have to pretty much line it up perfectly on the software that I use. And I'm able to print it right onto the shoes. The printing process takes about a minute and a half. It's really quick. But the part that's really, it takes a while is lining up the design to be perfect um, so that it's not an inch above the red line there. Uh, and that happens, so then I have to start a new pair, which stinks, but it, it's good practice for me. So 
I also have to tape it, as you see, so I don't want the paint to go onto the, the soles of the shoes. So it's a really learning curve. Uh, the tape takes a, a kind of a while for each shoe. Uh, the whole shoe process is when I first started in November, when I received the printer, it was taking me 45 minutes for one pair of shoe, which I realized that was not going to work if I was going to start selling a lot more. So I'm down to, you know, I can do some pairs in about five minutes and then ones like that that you see on, on the printer um, with the Skyline, that could take me 20 minutes sometimes. But I'm getting a lot faster and I know that if I keep going, it'll, it'll only get faster. So the, the challenges that I saw, that I faced, were raising money. Uh, that was the hardest part. I, first of all, I, I was, my background is social work and I never thought I was going to have a business, go into business. I really knew nothing about it. Uh, but my family is made up of a bunch of entrepreneurs. I have three brothers. Two of them have businesses. My mom had her own business. So it was in my family, but I just didn't think it was for me. Um, but about four years ago, that kind of changed. And since then, I, I have tons of business ideas, but not enough time to, to work on all of them. So balancing a social life is a huge part of uh, running a business and working full time. It's, it's hard to manage these social relationships, um, but it's, it's worth making that time and effort to, to talk to your friends, to go out and do something fun. Um, I'm running every aspect of the business myself. I, from shipping, packaging, to printing the shoes, to social media, I built my website, uh, everything, which is, it's been great because I've been able to build my brand how I want it, but at the same time, it's exhausting. You get burnt out, um, and it's it's really tough. So working full time and doing creative souls, I work pretty much nine to five every day, and then I go home and eat dinner, and then I get working on creative souls from seven p.m. to eleven or twelve sometimes, and it's it's a crazy amount of work, um, but it's it's truly something I'm passionate about, and, and I want to make it work. So. To me, it's worth it, and I, I pretty much take the weekends to, to have self-care and do something fun. Um, and then the last thing is limited funds. Just a lot of the things that you see on the printer, the ink, each cartridge uh, costs anywhere from $300 to $500 of ink, and ink goes fast. So uh, for a while, when I first launched to where I launched shoes, um, I was not making that much money, so it was hard. I, I wasn't printing that much, and as the printer sits idle, the ink is kind of just evaporating. Um, so I'm losing money, but that kind of changed since I've launched Shoes. Uh, in August, I launched my new website, and I launched Shoes to be available as well. Um, my successes, I was, Creative Souls was featured on NBC Chicago uh, News um, at five o'clock. Uh, I was on the Chicago Tribune, the radio station, Big 95.5, uh, and a local journal in Champaign, Illinois. I received the printer, which was amazing, and I was so happy to, to have that. Uh, my new website was live, which took me about five months because I was doing that while also sometimes printing and working full time, so that was difficult. In the past two months, since I've really launched my new website, uh, I've had six different artists have products sold with their designs on it, and I've given back almost $500 to these various artists in the past two months. Uh, and we're truly making an impact one creative soul at a time. Uh, quick advice that I give is that burning out is real, and it really you need to have self-care. It's, it's a must in the, having a business. Just doing, taking the time to do things you love um, is super important, seeing your friends and watching a movie from time to time. Uh, expect long hours, it can be long, it can be tiring, everything costs more than I ever realized, so I could be the same for other businesses, I think, too. Uh, it takes commitment. You truly have to love what you do. Uh, creative Souls, it's part of my life and I love it. It's something I'm passionate about. It's the same population I'm working with full time, so it's, I really love what I'm doing, and, and it's important because if I wasn't, there would be no way that I would have made it this far with it.
Uh, you can follow us on all platforms, pretty much at Be Creative Souls. Uh, and my website is BeCreativeSouls.com. And these are just some pictures of design, shoes, shirts, some of our artists, uh, and more. And thanks. And there's a 10% off all products if you want to use the code BeCreative10. Uh, you can write that down. And we always have free shipping on every product, as long as you're in the U.S. So. Could you, could you send me that PowerPoint and I can send it out? Yeah, yeah, I'll definitely do that. Any questions? Yeah. How do you pay the artists? So basically every month I go through all the orders and add up how many shirts or shoes they, they uh, sold. And so for every pair of shoes, they earn $8 every time one of their designs sells on a shoe. Uh, and then every shirt, they earn $4. So I basically send checks to them Pretty much so. August, I just I'm sending the August month checks um, shortly. Like on Monday, I'm sending the check to their guardian or to the individual themselves. And then it basically takes me a month to add everything up, make sure no one returns anything. Um, so that's it. Yeah. How do you recruit the artists? Yeah. So I recruit the artists. Basically, right now it's a lot of word of mouth. Um, I've had a lot of people reach out to me through Facebook. That's where I'm kind of, I have the biggest following on Facebook right now. So if you search Be Creative Souls, you'll, you'll be able to find it. Um, but that's, that's the main way right now. I have started reaching out to local agencies, agencies in different states. Um, there was one artist who actually went viral on a, a, a platform called Reddit, and I reached out to him. And he, he paints with his mouth. Um, and his designs are amazing. It's actually, this design right here is created by him. His name's Alex. And he's from Colorado. So just word of mouth, reach out to agencies. And people are able to apply through my website on BeCreativeSouls.com. There's a section for artists. And you can just click apply here. And it's really just getting to know you. It's a little bio. Um, and then I make a. I make a artist page for each artist, and I could just really quickly. So this is my website. Uh, so you go to artists, you go to apply here. Uh, but really quick, so these are our artists so far. So each artist has an artist page that you can click into and get to know them. Can you hear me? Yeah. My first comments is, uh, is wow. Um, just an impressive group of panelists um, that are showcasing their work, um, their creativity, their ingenuity. And uh, did I mention the hard work um, <laughs> doing a business? Not easy. Um, and uh, before I talk about a way in which you can find funding <laughs> to perhaps start up your own micro business for a loved one with disabilities or a family member, <laughs> Um, I have to do what Kelly said and sell, sell, sell. <laughs> and talk just briefly about my organization. Um, I'm the executive director of Life's Plan Incorporated. Um, we were founded by the Ray Graham Association back in 1986. We were part of a legislative package with the state of Illinois. We were called the Self-Sufficiency Trust of Illinois. We were the first pool trust program in the United States that helped families and individuals protect their private assets um, while their individuals, their loved ones, could retain the benefits, Medicaid, SSI, and they could have use of the funds for the things that they wanted for their loved ones when they were no longer there. Uh, winter coats, shoes, um, travel, entertainment costs, all the things that usually SSI and Medicaid can't cover. And when we were called the Self-Sufficiency Trust, um, it was important for the board at the time, when it was run by Ray Graham, to in fact, create a charitable remainder trust, and we still call that today our self-sufficiency charitable fund. And guess what we do with that? We do charitable things with it, and we have been doing that since, I would say, the late 90s. We have been distributing uh, grants and funding to nonprofits and to individuals, and uh, more importantly for this group, uh, to individuals, families, and nonprofits in uh, funding micro-enterprise businesses of up to $2,000. So we have been engaged in doing this, I'd say, about 10 years now. And uh, 
we have, uh, full disclosure, have a couple of board members here with us to my left. Um, and we have taken a look at this and we really feel this is a positive impact on the community and the best way we can do that. Sure, we would love to give all our nonprofits that we love lots of money. And we feel like with unrestricted donations, that's a good thing. But we have a limited amount of money. And we think we want to give back to the right <coughs> folks here that really could benefit with opportunities that only make them more self-sufficient, get them on Medicare, can make them feel productive in their lives, in the community. And that's really why we, I love these grants. And I know most of my board does, if not all of them do. And so it's important uh, to understand that um, we value these, these grants. And what we've sort of seen in a trend here is that we've seen sort of kind of a falling off with applications. And, and I, it, whether it's my fault for not marketing enough, or it's just, as you've heard from Matt and others, it's really hard. Um, and, and we want to fund, um, because we are trustees and we're fiduciaries over people's special needs trusts, it's really important that we take our distributions of our charitable funds seriously and our fiduciary responsibilities and make sure it's going now to the right folks, but that they really have a good business plan and perhaps they have good supports and perhaps they have customers and ideas that are not just ideas but are really ramping up. We want to be that. We want to help those folks bridge the gap from being where we don't have what we need right now to getting them to where they're going, like Kelly here, where she's got her own business and being successful. The grant funds are there to help bridge that gap so that now they're earning and sell, 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 making that money as a for-profit business, not a non-for-profit, not a consumer advocate business, but a for-profit business for themselves. It could be two hours a week, it could be 18, 40, whatever hours they desire, but it's gonna help them um, in growing their business, feeling productive, being part of the community, and that we feel like that we can offer this and that we're gonna get a reflection back. So let me just briefly talk about it. I've, um, I don't see a lot of people have these, but we have the grants here. Um, I also have it on our website as well. It's, I'm not gonna scan that. So it's listed right here, um, so you can click on it. So you can find it on our website on www.liceplanning.org and information about it. We also have it out there. And we also put together some examples of funds we've provided in the past to help understand where we helped bridge that gap and get folks to where they wanted to go with the business and help develop that business. So it was really important for us and so what I've added with this application is I've added talent. I brought, I brought the talent with me. Here they are. And they're on the application. So if anybody has any questions about their application, Consuelo Puente, who is bilingual, has taught how, how to fill out and complete our application, not only in English, but also in Spanish. So there's no excuse that you can't figure out how to do a business model or a plan. Matt has shared his advisement, his PowerPoint. You guys can use his PowerPoint. You can contact Matt, his email's here as well. You can contact me as well. So we really want to get the word out. The deadline is the night before Thanksgiving, uh, midnight, uh, November 27th. And when we say funding of up to $2,000, we sort of mean that we want the funding to be what it's intended for. So for some folks, they may only need $500. I don't know, maybe we have bought a guy a van that all he needed, he had a vending business and he needed to get from point A to point B, go to the Coca-Cola dealership, which they had a business partnership with, and pick the, the sodas up and load them into the vending machines at the golf course they had already you know, leased and set up at the, uh, at the vending sites. So things like that are really what we're looking for and we want to help give back to the community. We, want, we think these are valued um, grants but we also know the niche of it, that it's not for everybody, and we want uh, to pass the word out. So we ask you to share the good news about this, and there's still time to get those grants in. And does anybody have any questions about Life's Plan or our grant program? Yes? Did you allude to a, uh, the fact that it's easier to get a grant for 
grant if you're for profit rather than a non for profit, or does it not matter? We, we wrangle with this a lot, so we prefer to be a for profit. Um, consumer advocate groups are really good, but they are consumer advocate groups and we support them, but we just don't fund them. So I don't know if I, that answers your question or not. So is that, is that for your company? That you have that preference? Do you have to know in general if it's easier to get funding as a non for profit versus a for profit? It's definitely easier to get funding for, as far as grants go, for non profits, is what I would say in general. So I think sometimes folks get confused that they come to us and they may have a microboard and they may want to set up as a nonprofit, but we're probably not looking, and maybe they're not looking quite the way Matt looks at it, like uh, Kelly looks at it here and, and her mom as a for-profit endeavor. That's what we're looking for. Because we've had some great you know, t-shirt companies, shoe company um, individuals that are advocating for more mental health services. And that's great, but we're not, funding that. So just to be clear on it. Is it for the, uh, I don't know that much about the SSI requirements, but does it not matter how you get paid? Because if you're not for profit and, and your, uh, your special needs relative is working there and gets a paycheck, doesn't it fulfill the requirement? Yes. 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 So, okay. I should clarify this though. It's possible you have a microboard that's a nonprofit and a business that's a for profit. That's plausible too, if that doesn't confuse everybody. <laughs> Meaning the nonprofit surrounds the individual to protect the assets because they're not her name, his well, or her well, name. Well, but the for profit is its own thing. Non for profit doesn't mean that the person doesn't make money. Right. right. And there's different variances. Yes, there's. Yes. And there's very different variances of the nonprofit we're not going to talk about today. But yes, you have a question. One of the things we provide to the community on our services is free consultation. Whether finding an attorney, understanding benefits, we, that's what we do daily. We navigate trusts and dispersing them, collecting earned income, unearned income, assets, countable assets, non countable assets, and converting them into non countable resources and making sure that the public benefits are not affected adversely. That's our job. So we can provide that information at no cost to families and professionals, so happy to answer those questions. And we're not making the check out to that individual. Right. We're giving them to, the check would probably go to the support person or the support agency, whatever, but we're not giving it to them, so it won't affect their benefits. That's what I was trying to get to end with, with the gentleman back, is that the money we give out, let's say it's the $2,000 because we think that person's awarded that, should be awarded that, is it's unearned income for the sake of unearned income, and then it's a resource the next month. So we, we are very cautious about how we're going to delegate that money out, how it's going to be a transition either to somebody's microboard nonprofit, or it's going to be to a family member, or it's going to be somewhere else so they don't lose critical SSI and Medicaid benefits. And we'll make sure to consult on that as well when needed. So, any other questions? Well, thank you very much.